This week, we get closure. The biggest question of H64 is the presidential election. And this week, we see the Democratic Convention. Who will decide Lincoln's opponent? The party's goals and McClellan's running mate. I mean, whoever gets the presidential nomination. But there's more than politics. General Hood in Atlanta is in dire straits. And the Virginia Valley echoes gunfire. I wonder how many times I can make reference to the Valley of Death passage before it becomes a beaten dead horse. Last thing first, Sheridan officially replaces the incompetent General David Hunter with the better option, General George Crook, who now leads the Department of West Virginia. Though he has led it on the field for weeks. First thing next. Yeah, I think that makes sense. The continuation of the battle at Smithfield Crossing. More accurately, the action around Charlestown. But this war has never had good naming. Last week left us with a federal counterattack. This week, it continues. The 28th Sheridan pushes all over. His infantry continue their Charlestown securement. Admiral's cavalry go to Martinsburg. Wilson rides to Shepherdstown. And Merritt, bege- and Merritt brings his mounted men to Lee Town. Lee Town. The Confederate horsemen are relaxing when shots fly by them. Merritt has got the jump on them. Each man runs to his horse and flees. Merritt's men with sabers drawn pursue them. And that night, they're in Smithfield. 29th early counterattacks, first in Martinsburg. Rebel officer Rhodes brings his division to drive our Avril. This succeeds. Two of the three divisions chase out Merritt, but when the division of James Rickett arrives, they counterattack and retake the town. The next day, General Wilson joins and the rebels fall back. 31st, Sheridan's line is steady. The situation is stable. Lee bites the bullet. He needs more men. He asks for the reinforcements he sent to General Early to come back. By the 31st, Generals Anderson and Kershaw are back in Winchester, ready to start their march to Petersburg. Valley must be held by the Second Corps alone. Rebels have won victories around Petersburg, but each success has a cost. And as you can see, Lee needs more men to pay it. This week at Petersburg, it's quiet. Both sides leading the artillery and sharpshooters whittle away their opponents. It seems like we are getting the better of those rebels. But Grant's small successes can't compare to Sherman in Georgia. While Officer Alpheus S. Williams has done well in leading the 20th Corps, we all know that Brigadier General's leadership would be temporary. The 27th, with cheers from the infantry, Major General Henry Slocum arrives. Change of command complete. The march to Jonesboro continues. Hood's headquarters, 30th, night. General Hardy is yelling in panic. The enemy are advancing south. Hood finally understands the terrible situation he is in, and soon Hardy's corps is marching. You must not fail to attack the enemy as soon as you get your troops up. Stephen D. Lee is then sent to reinforce Hardy. Twelve hours later, the rebels are in position. Hood receives a request to travel to the front. He finds it unwise. The Union line is advancing. The delay of the rebels has given time for entrenchment, forcing a battle soon, or less the charge of the Confederates break against breastworks. The battle begins farther south. Kilpatrick's cavalry are dismounted behind rail lines with their Spencer rifles, the ideal position. They aren't fighting the ideal opponents. General Mark Lowry's infantry division, formerly Claiborne's veterans, as Claiborne has taken over Hardy's corps. The Greycoats advance against the 16th Corps, but are quickly broken by the unexpected fire of Judson Kilpatrick. The rebels rally and charge our cavalry, but are again routed. North, a broken charge by the secessionist battered brigades of General Brown are broken under fire from General Logan's corps. The current commander of the Confederates, Anderson, is even wounded. Back to Kilpatrick, who under continued assaults is forced back to Flint River, where Federal infantry reinforces and countercharges the Army of Hardy, retaking all lost ground and ending the day with a glorious victory. We lost 179 men. The Rebels, 1,700. Could things get worse for Hardy? Message for Hardy. From General Hood. Sherman is going to attack Atlanta. Please send Lee's Corps back. He is needed for the defense of the city. Now Hardy has a captured staff officer of General Oliver Otis Howard, who has informed him he is facing six corps down in Jonesboro. But Hood won't believe anything that doesn't reinforce his belief of the imminent assault of Atlanta. Lee begins his march back to Hood on the night of the 31st. September 1st opens with the rebels being split. Hood and General Stewart are in Atlanta. Lee is halfway between Hood and Hardy, who's in Jonesboro. Rebels under William J. prepare their lines for advance of Howard. General Davis formed his divisions in line about 4 p.m., swept forward over some old cotton fields in full view, went over the rebel parapet handsomely, capturing the whole of Govan's brigade with two field batteries of 10 guns. Being on the spot, I checked Davis's movement and ordered General Howard to send the two divisions of the 17th Corps, Blair, round by his right rear, to get below Jonesboro, to reach the railroad so as to cut off retreat in that direction. 
I also dispatched orders after orders to hurry forward Stanley so as to lap around Jonesboro in the east, hoping thus to capture the whole of Hardy's corps. I sent first Captain Andred, aide de camp, then Colonel Poe of Engineers, and lastly General Thomas himself. That was the only time during the campaign I can recall seeing General Thomas urge his horse into a gallop. I was approaching, and the country on the farther side of the railroad was densely wooded. General Stanley had come up on the left of Davis and was deploying, though there could have not been on his front more than a skirmish line. Had he moved straight on by the flank or by a slight circuit to his left, we have enclosed the whole ground occupied by Hardy's corps, and that corps could have not escaped us. But night came on, and Hardy did escape. The second day saw 1,272 federal casualties and 1,400 rebel losses, but that's not all. That night I was so restless and impatient that I could not sleep. About midnight, there arose toward Orlando sounds of shells exploding. Another sound, like that of musketry. This isn't the sound of battle, but instead 81 rail cars of ammunition exploding. Hood has evacuated Atlanta. The 2nd of September, General Henry Slocum and his men marched down the streets of Atlanta. Atlanta was ours, and fairly won. After months of fighting, thousands of deaths, tens of thousands of men permanently scarred both physically and mentally. The city of the South has fallen. Hood's army is in disarray. The question now is, what is next? Where can Truman go from here? He can advance south to Macon, Georgia, move to free those at Andersonville, or turn east and strike Augusta, cutting further rebel rail lines. Or, and this would obviously be very far away, he could advance on Savannah and sever the secessionists in two. But that, of course, would only be after several more campaigns. My home state of Missouri has shared the burden of this war bravely, from families torn apart in political strife to the destruction of our land under the march of battle to the crime against humanity of massacres that sadly occur within its borders. But as the war continued and the Union pushed south, we have since been removed from the terrifying effects of campaigns and combat. Former Governor Major General Sterling Price has long hoped to bring the Show Me State under his supervision. After lengthy debates with his superior Edmund Kirby Smith, he gets the go-ahead. His force is small, his command at each other's throats low on food, weapons, and ammunition, and just to make things worse, his political rival, self-proclaimed Governor Thomas C. Reynolds, as a lieutenant governor, he took over following exiled Governor Claiborne Jackson. He has since lost any sort of legitimacy by having gone beyond the late Jackson's term. With Hood's army broken, Lee's army held at bay, and the valley seeing no great success, Price's expedition is hoped to rejuvenate rebel morale and hurt Lincoln's chances in the upcoming election. They begin their march on the 29th with their target of St. Louis. Wait, I live there. Oh, no, 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 no. Um... I will bravely stand by my city in the basement under this desk. Chicago, Illinois, by couch, ferry, and train, thousands arrive at the city and head towards the amphitheater. The city of Chicago is no stranger to political conventions. It saw the nomination of Lincoln four years ago, but this time around, it's his opponents, the Democrats, who are holding their conference in the Windy City. Similar to the Republicans, or should I say National Union Party, the party of Jackson has no confusion over their presidential candidate, but the platform and the running mate is up for grabs. Starting with the executive nomination, George B. McClellan, former General-in-Chief, wins handsomely as his rivals in the Copperhead camp struggle to come up with a candidate. Next, the vice presidency. With no clear consensus, a total of eight nominees are voted on. First, War Democrat and former Secretary of the Treasury, James Guthrie of Kentucky, with 65 and a half votes. Close behind in second place, with 55 and a half votes, is Representative George Pendleton of Ohio, a Peace Democrat. Far behind in third place is Senator Lazarus W. Powell, middle of the line man with 32 and a half votes. The remaining candidates are all local legends and favorite sons. Looks like Guthrie just needs to win over Powell, make concessions to the state sons and he will take the nomination. But when roll call comes, the political calculus changes. Both Guthrie and Powell aren't seeking the candidacy. Their supporters shift, and Pendleton takes the lead. With no other choice, the second ballot, a unanimous decision, the Copperhead co-commander, friend of Clement Vandegham, firebrand opponent of the Oval Office, Ohio Representative George Pendleton, will be McClellan's running mate. That leaves one final piece on the agenda. The agenda. The party platform. 
While the king of the Copperheads, Clement Van de Kamp, knew a potential presidential nomination with his name would be political poison, he does get to write the platform. It's short and single issue. End of the war as early as possible. Nothing on economics or foreign policy. The only other resolutions are to condemn Lincoln and thank the troops. A peace platform, diametrically opposed to McClellan's views. To say the convention was confusing would be an understatement. The presidential nominee is days away from decrying the platform of his party, not even to mention his disagreements with his vice presidential candidate. For a party so focused on the ongoing insurrection, you'd think it would not fall to its own disunion. Following the finalization of his opponent's candidacy, Lincoln on the second meets with political advisors from all around the country to get an understanding of his support. From a political death match to potential political suicide, President Jefferson Davis gets a message from his chief commander, Robert E. Lee. The means of obtaining men for field duty, as far as I can see, are only three. A considerable could be placed in the ranks by relieving all able-bodied white men employed as teamsters, cooks, mechanics, and laborers, and supplying their places with Negroes. I think measures should be taken at once to substitute Negroes for white in every place in the army connected with it, where the former can be used. It seems to me that we must choose between employing Negroes ourselves or having them employed against us. A thorough and vigorous inspection of the roles of exempted and detailed men is, in my opinion, of immediate importance. The rest of the letter laments the exhaustion of reserves. The rebellion is desperate for manpower. His lines are stretched thin, and on all other fronts, the Union with its colored troops have pushed back Lee's comrades. 1864 began with a push for slaves to be used in the secessionist military. January 2nd, Major General Patrick Claiborne wrote and had fellow commanders sign a very similar position. It was immediately suppressed for being detrimental to the state of the nation. But Lee, you can't suppress your main commander like you do a major general. Sickles time. He watches his party convention with great disappointment. He knows McClellan is no traitor, but the platform might as well be written by Davis. With politics a disappointment, he writes to Lincoln on the first about the military. In consequence of the expiration of the terms of service of many of the New York and New Jersey regiments belonging to my old corps, and the consolidation of others, there are some 15 or 20 numbers no longer represented in the service. I am confident that with proper and sufficient facilities to reorganize and fill up my old Army Corps, third, with new regiments made up partly of veterans and the remainder of volunteers, which would replace the regiments that have gone out of service. There is one division of my corps now left in the field. It would not be necessary to disturb this until I had completed the two new divisions. The local aid and cooperation I could command, a very large number of men can be obtained who would not otherwise enter the service. I often let my fascination with Dan get in the way of my analysis, but honestly this is a good idea. The Army of the Potomac is in need of men, and while draftees are able to do this, veterans and volunteers are able to stand up to gunfire. With the pull of sickles, this could be accomplished. That's where the week ends, and my lord, there's a lot to pull together. First, let's talk politics. The election of 1864 could decide the fate of the war. For the longest time, Lincoln has been left behind by the presumptive Democrat candidate McClellan. But after the confused convention in Chicago, I believe the party of Jackson is going to have a tough campaign, especially after the victory at Atlanta. One of the biggest criticisms of the administration is the seeming stalemate of the war. But with the victory of Sherman on top of the seizing of Mobile Bay, well, Let's just say that General Will Mack will have to prove his credentials as a fighter to stay in this race. Hi, it's the entire Civil War Week by Week team here, and I hope you enjoyed this episode with his tongue twisters, jokes. Writer Jonathan really is a pain in the neck to actor Jonathan. I also hope that you are excited as, as I am on an upcoming secret project that will just have to wait. But all I can say is you'll be seeing a lot more of my hometown. Thank you, and I do hope to see you next week.